Here, I'm going to pass these out. You can pass those out. Would you like this pulled down? Or? Yes. How about some lights up? Okay. Well, first off, I'd like to say you can sit in if you'd like. Okay. First off, I'd just like to say thanks for letting me come in. Uh, it's kind of nice to come in and be able to talk with you guys. I know exactly what you feel like right now, and uh, I bet you can't wait to get on to your last round of clinical and done. So, I'm just going to quickly talk about traveling physical therapy as a new graduate, and the reason I kind of wanted to come in was I'd like to, to start doing these kind of educational sessions. That's good. At, uh, it's fine. Oh. Educational sessions <laughs> at um, schools around the country because I plan on doing traveling therapy for at least two years, and my goal is to make it to every corner of the country, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, so actually, right after I get done with this, my car is completely packed outside. I'm heading to Boston. I'm driving to Boston. So that's where I'm going now. Um, so this is really kind of catered towards understanding what traveling therapy is as a whole because I know when I started looking into it, you're like, I don't really have an idea what it's about. So anytime you ask that question, just go ahead and throw a hand up and answer them. I also have you know, a Q&A area at the end. So this is kind of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, what is it like to travel, the pros and cons. It's definitely not for everybody. Uh, what your bottom line end up, ends up being. What to look out for between traveling companies because some companies are fly, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, the best way to go about being a traveling therapist, my recommendations for certain companies, I work for Arias Medical, which my card is on there, but I'm not only recommend, there are dozens of, dozens of companies out there, and there are a, a good handful of, of quality companies, and they're all, they're all great to work for. So traveling therapy, as a traveling therapist, you are pressure relief for the company or the client that you go to, whether that's a hospital or a clinic. Um, essentially, they have a caseload of patients coming in. If it's a hospital, they can't really turn patients away. And if it's a clinic, they don't want to lose that business. They have a caseload they cannot maintain with their current staffing. The current staffing issue occur is, is a mistake because either somebody got fired they're looking to expand and they just are looking for a permanent placement or somebody goes on maternity leave. And so they hire a traveler to come and fill that gap of uh, cover that workload until they can hire a permanent placement. Or even sometimes um, a really interesting thing is there are actually seasonal traveling therapy jobs. Like in the southern area, New Mexico, Florida, where all the snowbirds, the retired people come from the north to the south, they actually hire specifically in Florida um, for the winter months. So that way you can, you know, meet the demand of uh, the retirees coming down. It's typically a 13-week assignment. Um, it's obviously about three months. It can be anywhere from four weeks to 51 weeks is the technical longest that you can work at one place. That's always in the contract. 13 weeks is like 99.9% .9 of the contract, so and then sometimes there's an extension. Um, and you are a contracted therapist. So my last assignment, I was in Bemidji, Minnesota, which was two hours from Canada. And I was working for a hospital, Stanford Health. I actually wasn't working for that hospital. I was there, and it, to, to a patient it looked like I was you know, working for that hospital, but my checks were coming from Arias Medical, and I really didn't have, you know, I wasn't technically working for Stanford. Uh, so the pros and cons of traveling therapy. I think that the pros greatly outweigh the cons, but I might be biased. Um, you can develop yourself as a PT. When I kind of thought of it this way when I was sitting down trying to decide if I was going to go do it. Um, many times you've gone out on clinicals, and you've probably seen CIs that have been in the same position in the same hospital for 20 years. and you know what, they pretty much kind of plateaued developing as a professional as soon as they got out of school, other than continuing education, and you know, that's kind of what you make of it. As a traveling therapist, I also personally make it a goal to travel to clinics and hospitals, outpatient and inpatient, and rural and urban settings. 
So my last place was 15,000 people, it was the city, and it was a small hospital. I worked in both the skilled nursing facility and the inpatient rehab facility. Um, it's exactly like you're still a traveling graduate, or a traveling uh, a student going on clinicals, in that you get to go to work, but you see all these different treatments that your colleagues are doing, and you can discuss with them what they're doing. So you, I'm going to continue to, to learn as, as if I was a student the entire time I do traveling therapy. I think that's huge versus a peer that goes straight to Cox Health and gets into a rut and they're pretty much done. I, I personally want to, once you get out there you realize that, I mean Dr. Cook has said it and I think Dr. Tahoy says it a lot, you are not an expert, you are just competent. And you get out there and you kind of realize that there's a lot to know and continuing education kind of has a big gap to fill. You can try a region before you settle. like. If you want to move out to Boston, you have never been to Boston, you can go on a 13-week assignment out there. And the way that travel and therapy works, and you have to check it out between companies, they only sign you for the 13-week assignment. You're done after that, unless you sign another assignment. So after 13 weeks, you can sign off, and you don't have to keep working for them, you can take up a permanent position. So you can move out to California or the New England area and work get paid for 13 weeks, try out the area, and either decide, yeah, I want to make a permanent move out here or not. You always get to choose the setting, state, and your housing situation, setting being a you know, skilled nursing, inpatient, all that stuff. The state, I mean, that's obvious. The next one is it's a challenge. Um, I enjoy that. I, I get bored quickly. I need to constantly be going for something else. Showing up to a new hospital, or a new clinic every 13 weeks and hitting the ground, as Dr. Cook said, hitting the ground running and just take off. I enjoy that challenge. Um, most hospitals and, and places you go to are very helpful and, and, and realistic in setting your your kind of goals. They don't expect you to show up the first day and be 100% productive, you know, but the challenge is always there. Uh, you get to see the country. Another great thing, as a new graduate or any traveler, you can have a travel buddy. So let's say Ben and Brandon, they wanted to travel the country together right out of school, right? I don't know if they hate each other or not. I'm just giving you some to tell. That might not be a good one. Um, but they can travel the country together and they share the same, they can share the same housing, okay? Cut that housing stipend in half. They end up both increasing their bottom line, plus they have a friend somewhere in the, with them. Um, when I was in Bemidji, there were two other new grads that graduated from uh, the school in Omaha, Nebraska. And they both were, you know, friends from school and they were doing the travel buddy thing. And, you know, they worked actually side by side in the, in the, the, in or the outpatient clinic. Uh, another huge pro is the pay. It's second to none, especially as a new graduate. It's going to make you sick when you see it. Um, also, you can get extensions or you can stay. My company actually doesn't just do traveling assignments. They do traveling assignments and always, they're also trying to do permanent placements. So if you're ever looking for a permanent placement out in New York, any of those places, you can call many of these traveling companies and they'll say, okay, we'll, we'll keep our ears open for a permanent position in this region and we'll let you know. Okay, and they get, it's not an even, a, it's like a finder speed, but it's nothing really. I think it, it actually the, the client pays for it. Um, also, you can extend your assignment. If I hadn't had my back injury, I was actually going to stay for an additional four weeks. So I was going to be there for, you know, 17 weeks. Um, the cons, you have to travel often. I kind of like it. It's fun. Um, you, you get to go where you want to go. It's not like they're telling you, you know, you got to go to Mississippi and maybe I should, maybe some people like Mississippi. Um, you always have to adapt to new documentation systems, but how many, well, you guys have been on four, right? Four rotations? Three. Three. So you guys have the last three left. By the time you guys get out, everyone you've gone to is a new documentation system and it's all becoming elect electronic now. You know, I think 2014, they all have to be electronic. It's really, and especially with our age, 
we just pick it up quick. So I, I hardly find that as a con. There are just some, there are some things that are kind of quirky with some systems, but you're going to get that wherever you go. The one that I had to deal with was um, I had to study for my, I graduated May 18th, and I started work May 21st, that Monday. And so I had to take the MPTE while I was on a temp license, hoping that I did, I passed it. Um, and study while I was working. That's not that hard. Once you guys go and you guys have to take the peak exam when you come back from your guys' uh, rotations, which is just a practice MPTD, if you study, you know it. It's, it. it's not that big of a deal at all, unless you're kind of ner nervous all the time. <laughs> if you start out, yeah, so, so maybe you guys shouldn't do it. No. Uh, you have to be on a temp license if you start out right away. Like, I was on a temp license. If you if you don't have your, you know, DPT national board exam completed, there are certain states that do temp licenses. There are certain states that don't. Minnesota does. Missouri does not. Um, I think Nevada does. New Mexico might. The traveling company will work out all that stuff with you if you're interested. Um, the quality. Yeah. As far as from the client, yes. so like the hospital itself, mm -hmm. I have I have not encountered this yet, but my company has asked me several times because I'm kind of controlled. Like I talk to an account manager that manages a certain region, so they know that specific like four states, and they ask a lot like, "Are you being treated well?" And then the, the actually the supervisor at the hospital asked a couple times, "Are you being treated well?" Some places, and this is just what I've heard, some places that you go, they don't care for you a whole lot. I have not encountered that yet. I'm kind of interested to encounter that because I think it's a little ridiculous that they'll treat you different just because you're trying to build a job. Um, yeah, I think that that does happen sometimes. It might be dependent on where you go. So, I have a yeah. Um, when you are going right in I know you said that they're really understanding or, you know, whatever. Do you feel like when you go there, you're just nervous caseload yeah. or does that come into play? When I, I cannot say enough good things about the place I went. Um, when I was talking to my company and getting where my recruiter and I was working through, I said, hey, I want to do this. My first one, I don't care where I go. And then you have a phone interview with the, the client. And I told the client, I said, hey, I'm a new grad. You know, I, I am confident. I definitely I'm competent as well, but I'm a new grad. Do you guys have a mentor there, someone that I can bounce ideas off of? Like I can complete the caseload, but you know, I've only been doing this for you know, I've been in school for three years for this and I've only had thirty six weeks of rotation. Um, so that is definitely something that you that they do. They definitely put you with a mentor because nobody has an unrealistic expectation that you're gonna be you know, outstandingly, you can run the whole department when you get there. That's that's just not realistic. So, for my opinion, I would say it depends on the company, and you just want to be always be very upfront with both the client and the company about your capabilities and your comfort zone. And they asked me a ton of times at the company or the client when I was there. The, they were like, "Are you doing okay? Do you, we need to back down your caseload?" I'm like, "Guys, I'm I'm bored half the time. Give me more stuff." So that's kind of how it works. So the company makes sure you have a mentor there, or you have to make sure that. The, so I'll, I'll just start using Aria instead of company because I can like mixing them up right now. So the hospital, I talked to the hospital during my phone interview and said, "Hey, do you guys have a mentor?" The company Aria also said, "Hey, we're going to find a place that is because they get your resume. The hospital gets your resume. The clinic gets your resume, and they." say yeah we want them or no we don't okay so it's, it's always up to the to the hospital to decide if they want you on they know you're a new graduate um, everybody wants to make sure that you're gonna be able to succeed there because if you land a placement and you can't complete the job it helps absolutely no one in this situation 
that hospital doesn't want to work through that company again, you know, that company doesn't want to work with you, you want to hang yourself, it's just, you know, you just can't take it. So they always, you know, work together and, and solve it that way, okay? Definitely, some, some of the qualities that I find to be a successful traveler, you have to be confident. You show up at a new place and sometimes you just kind of, you know, they can tell you make it kind of thing, you know. Show up, you got to be confident. You're at a new hospital, you're walking around to find a patient in, an acute, in their room, you have no idea where you're going, you know, but you just got to put on the I know what I'm doing face and, and get it done. Uh, definitely be independent, that's kind of obvious. You're going to have to be around the country. Um, some places, you, like some clinics, you will be on your own. Um, there's a job that I'm interviewing for right now that I could be closing down the clinic at night, you know, so you, you have to be independent. Reliable, obviously, I mean, that's kind of self-explanatory. Flexible, um, the more flexible you are, it, like for me, I officially don't have a job in Massachusetts yet, okay? I have my license for Massachusetts, and it can move in a day. I actually have a phone interview today for a place in Massachusetts, and I potentially have a phone interview next week for a place in Massachusetts, and they're on opposite sides of the state, okay? But the Boston one is looking like it's gonna be a done deal. Um, my company loves me because they call me up and they're like, hey, do you wanna go to Florida? I'm like, sure, let's go. And the more flexible you are, the better that the client, the hospital likes you because you know, they want to fill that position immediately. The company likes you because they get to grab that position and not let some other company get it. You end up just getting a lot more opportunities if you're flexible. Uh, the challenge, you have to enjoy challenge. I mean, that's kind of part of this job, your, your pressure relief. You don't show up to clinics that are, that are boring and slow. You show up when they need someone to work. You have to be organized. Um, if you don't organize all your stuff together, it's going to take you longer to respond to emails, you're constantly moving. If you're not organized, it's going to be a headache every time. I'm I'm to the point where I have four totes, big plastic totes, and then like a plastic Rubbermaid dresser, and it takes me two hours to fill up all my stuff and to load my motorcycle on a trailer and to leave. And it takes me two hours to unpack. And after you do it a couple times, with especially with your your rotations, if you go out of state, you get to the point where you realize this is the stuff that I actually use. And this is the stuff that I use once a year. And being organized helps in every aspect, decrease the stress and everything. Uh, be a team player with both your company. You know, you might have to take a, or you might want to take a less desirable <coughs> position one time to get a higher pay in the next one or a better position the next one. That's good. Yeah. Uh, how difficult is it for you to change your license from state to state? Easy. Easy. The biggest problem is time. Um, Massachusetts took me about eight weeks to get it. I, so I have, I'm licensed in Minnesota and in Massachusetts. Um, the company reimburses for all of that. So I think it costs 365 to be licensed in Massachusetts. They reimburse completely if you, once you start working there. Um, and you can hold as many licenses as you want across it. So I can, I can technically I could have 50 state licensures. Um, and they do the referral or the, the renewal fee that you have to pay every two years for it, they, they reimburse for that as well. It's just paperwork, that's what it is. How long do you have to take your time? Is it like time off or do you quit Friday and then start tomorrow Monday? It's up to you. Um, they usually, so you get medical benefits, okay? Medical, dental, vision, all that stuff. Your benefits will carry two weeks after you finish your job. Okay, because you're not technically working for them for like two years, you're working 13 weeks at a time. And so once your 13 weeks end, you're really not an employee of that company anymore. But what they do is they carry that, that benefit out for two extra, extra weeks. So you have those two weeks that you can take off every time you want it. I personally want to start the next Monday. That's just my personality. Um, most of my recruiters, when I talk to them about that, think I'm insane. So it's really it's up to you. You could take six weeks off if you wanted. They don't. They don't force your hand at all. It's the flexibility on your part. Like you make every decision. So it's really great that way. Does that kind of answer your question? 
Uh, so, this is kind of the cool part. <laughs> the, let's talk the numbers here, right? So, we all kind of know that starting out, it varies depending on where you go. Rural area, urban area, you know, acute, outpatient, it all varies. These are actual numbers that I got from some of my peers within a range, okay? So, if you work at Cox, you get about 42,000 as a new grant. St. John, about 55,000. If you work in a rural area, like uh, Salem, Lebanon, 60 to 62,000. If you are a director for like Concentra, I know one of my classmates went and she works alone in Glenstone or something, runs it. She's about 70. If you do right out of the gate, travel and physical therapy, you make 85 to 100 grand. Right out of the gate. Um, that's, this is all working 40 hours a week, roughly 52 weeks of the year. Uh, I, I dropped the travel PT one down. I'm going to get over that a little bit this year as a new grad. It's insane. It's insane. That's not even it. Um, and I want to point out, I'm not pitching just ARIA. I'm pitching traveling therapy as a whole. So I'm not like, I'm not telling you these numbers trying to recruit you directly to ARIA or anything. I really just want to, you know, I'm passing through, come down and see some friends who want to show this, this stuff. So I'm not blowing any smoke. This is how you actually get paid for traveling therapy. You get a standard hourly rate wage. This is all in your contract when you get it. You get a standard hourly wage that's tax. I just threw a number in, 26, okay, dollars an hour, which if you were at Cox or St. John's, that's it, you're done. And that's complete, this is tax, the 26. The next one, you get a per diem, which is just a, like a weekly, a weekly allowance that they'll give you. Um, they assume, uh, seven dollars an hour, eight hours a week, five days a week, two hundred and eighty dollars is what they give you in your in your check. That's IRS approved. This right there, tax free. IRS says you can't tax it because and the, the whole reason that a lot of these are tax free, the companies aren't doing loopholes. They're not working the numbers. What it is is the government does not want holes in our healthcare system around the country, and so what they do is they entice medical travelers, any medical traveler, nursing, radiology, anything, get these benefits. So that's why we have these benefits, because they want us to go do stuff, and they know that to go to some of these rural, to go to Alaska might take a little bit of a convincing, and this is their, their convincing. So about $280 a week, you get a housing stipend, also tax-free. The lowest end I've ever heard of is $1,000. The high, the highest end I've actually heard of is like 22 to 24, or I'm sorry, $1,000, 22 to $2,200, or 22 to 2400 The mode to the most common number, not the average, is about $1,400. I was in, when I was in Bemidji, Minnesota, I was getting $1,500 a month in a town, a rural town of 15,000 people. My housing was $500. So I got the results of that check every month, tax free. They also furnish, uh, I think I talked about it later, I'll tell you this, later. Now here's the other thing. When I drive from, technically my permanent address is uh, in Iowa, and so I just set my parents' address as my permanent address. All my mail goes there, and I should have sent it to my dad's address, my mom never calls me when I get stuff, but that's my permanent address. They calculate the drive from there out to, like for me, Boston. I'm going to get 55 cents a mile. If from my house to Bemidji was about an eight-hour drive, you got $400 on tax, which kind of covers your travel fee there. Then, like I said earlier, you get a state, you get reimbursed for your state licensure and renewal. So that's non-tax, um, and it's like I said, state dependent for each each state. When do you guys have class next? Yeah. Okay. If I, you guys, if you, if you're not interested, don't worry. You can get up and leave. I won't. Good. Yeah, I, I didn't want to see your face anyway. So. Uh, so this is what it really means once you take into consideration all the tax stuff. And these are just random numbers. They're close. They're close. I kind of lowballed them a tad, but they're they're real close to what it is. Um, your hourly tax a week. So this is the 26 an hour, 40 hours. That's what you would make. 
your per diem is 280, travel stipend divided by four, about 350, assuming you get $1,400 uh, a month. This is what you would get before taxes. That is your after tax. And when I talked to the recruiter and I was like, no, no way, no way. Let's see, I wanted to do it regardless because I wanted to travel. That is my average check. It's insane, insane. That they, yeah, it's crazy as a new grad that you get that. Uh, so the last thing that a lot of people don't recognize until you start to really look at the numbers is that you are in a different tax bracket. You're not in the 85 grand to 100 grand tax bracket because you're not taxed on that. You're taxed on this is what your tax will come. Assuming that, that you got that $26 an hour, 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, that's what you make taxable. That's the same as the St. John's employee, but you're making 45% more. Yeah. Do you, does it depend on the places you get, is it all hourly or is it salary? The way they do it is it's technically hourly, but in the contract they say you will get 40 hours a week, okay? And so I think, because I got overtime a couple times on the, the one that I went to, and some places, like I'm looking at, like I'm, you're looking around in the jobs. Some, you get it just advertises it 30 hours a week, or you know weekends, or stuff like that. They break it down to hourly because I I think that it's just easier for everyone to see what your actual hourly is. Um, you work a standard shift. You, you don't really tell a huge difference. Other than that, I don't know why they break it down to hour, hourly and not a salary. So I don't have a perfect answer for you. So if you do overtime, or yeah, if you end up when you'll get reimbursed for that. Huh? You get paid overtime, yeah. It, it, and you get paid weekly, a weekly check. And so if they, if you're somewhere and it's a little slower that day and they send you home, do you still get reimbursed for 40 hours? Or? Um, it depends if it's like extremely lower than 40. If it's like 36, mm, you talk to your account manager, okay? And the way that it works, I had a couple times, like when I did it, I think that, what was it, Labor Day landed on my time, and the 4th of July landed on my contract, and they were right in the middle of the day, and my, my like, the skilled nurse facility was closed, uh, the PD department. And so I wasn't technically gonna make 40 hours that week. Um, so that my, the, the hospital supervisor actually talked to me, he's like, hey, what do you wanna do? Do you need to come in on the weekends or something? Can we make that 40, or do you not care? And then I talked to my account manager from Arius, and he's like, hey, whatever you want to do is fine. So they're supposed to hit that 40. There's a little leeway, and it's kind of up to you on how much leeway you want to give them. If you're constantly getting 25, 30 hours a week, which is ridiculous, because I don't know why they'd ever hire a traveler therapist for that, um, then that's something that you tell your account manager and your account manager gets onto them because the less you work, the less that your company gets paid. And they're the ones that are gonna do the more abrasive talking business wise. You don't wanna have to, you know, make any kind of tension that's unnecessary. As a contractor, do you normally get the the bad shift? Like do you have weekends? It's in the contract. It's in the contract. Uh, it all like it says straight up front. Um, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, you know. Um, there are, there's a couple that you can work weekends, um, and you go through a job interview as well. It's like, you say, your company sends off the resume. For, well, here's how it works. So a job in Massachusetts. My company calls me and tell them, hey, I'm interested in skilled nursing, inpatient. I, I don't want an outpatient orthopedic, which is crazy, but no, I, I do. Anyway. So I'd say I want these two preferences. A job opens, my recruiter calls me, says, hey Nick, we have a job for skilled nurse facility in Boston. You interested? Yeah, I'm interested. They send my application or my resume to the, to the skilled nursing facility and then the skilled nursing facility looks at it and says, yeah, we'll interview this guy. And then they call me on, on the phone and that's when you ask all your questions as well. You have to remember any even if you're not doing traveling therapy, 
you're going out to just you know do a permanent position we chose an excellent profession because we are expanding at, at such a rate that the businesses are fighting for you you aren't fighting for the businesses anywhere you want to go in the country you get to go so you need to make sure that when when you do an interview you aren't being interviewed completely you are interviewing that company so when, when they call me and interview me, I ask, okay, how many therapists work there? What is the turnover rate? You know, how many uh, clients do you see a day? What are the typical visits? And all that stuff. So, yeah. Do they help you find housing, or is that something that you have to kind of do on your own? Yeah, both. It's up to you. I, I shouldn't say both. There's a choice A. They'll find housing completely furnished. Done. You just say, so I'm going to do that when I go to, if I, if I land in the middle of Boston, I don't want to have to even worry about that stuff. So I'm going to say, guys, hey, find me some housing. And then you say, like, I, I'm going to prefer having a washer and dryer in my, you know, place. Um, I don't have a pet, so I don't have to worry about that, but they do accommodate pets. Um, you kind of lay out what you really are looking for in housing, and they'll find it for you. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I actually looked into that, seriously looked into it, and the problem is that the IRS does not consider that a non-taxable stipend amount, so they would be giving me like $1,500 or something, but it was taxed, and it ended up not working out in my favor at this point in my life because well, I had to pay for the trailer, I had to live out of the trailer, and then once you go places, you have to park on like a trailer area, and some of those are like 30 to $40 a day. I mean, they get expensive, depending on how many hookups you have, so it ends up not, there are tons of people that do it, but I don't know, to me, I haven't seen the benefit other than traveling with your house. So, so they do end up as far as I know, it's not, it, it changes this, yeah. And if they found a house for you, do you still have that stipend? Is that yep, like yep, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, yeah, so you get taxed on the 54 grand, which is the 25% bracket, if you're single, if you're single. So what is traveling like all the time? Um, it's just like you're on a clinical, that's what it is. You just show up to a new place and, and get to work. Uh, but you get paid well. Uh, you're constantly meeting new people, okay? Uh, I tend to like that, going around the country. You just kind of get into your social mood and you go to a hospital and people are like, oh, you're new? And you're like, well, I'm a traveling therapist. And especially being young, you're easy to get along with. And, you know, you, all you do is just say, when anytime someone asks you, hey, you want to go do this? Even if you're like tired and you just want to watch some show on TV, say yes, because you get out there and you network, and before you know it, you have literally stuff that you can do every single night with people around, and it, it, I love it, it's great, it's so great, just the networking alone and meeting different people in different regions is awesome. Again, you get to see new parts of the state, the region, nation, whatever you choose. Um, some, ther some traveling therapists decide that they want to work in just one state, and so they'll travel around just one state. I know that I work with an uh, she was probably in her 50s, and so she'd been PT for quite a while in Minnesota. And her whole thing was like, yeah, I just travel around Minnesota because my, my family's in Minnesota, so I just travel back and forth. And she had a permanent house that she kept there. So some people can stay in the space that they want. You can even do it, yeah. Could you do it even like in a radius? Like I live here, I want to do it in like an hour radius around here. There, the way that to technically be qualified as a traveling therapist you have to be, what they say is, 50 miles away from your permanent address, okay? So that's kind of how it works. Um, but I also read some things. This hasn't been an issue for me yet because I'm like trying to get as far away as I can. Uh, I have read some things that the IRS may look at it. If you get audited, they may be like, why are we giving you a housing stipend or these extra benefits when it only takes you 45 minutes to get to work. That's a typical commute for some people. 
So it has to be like a commute. What they, the class call it is you have to be able, it has to be more distant than, so if you were to drive to work, get off work, come home, you wouldn't have enough time to like completely rest up before you go back to work. That's when they consider a traveling um, medical professional. But the general rule of thumb is 50 miles. So that's something you can work out with. Okay. Um, Learning settings. The, the one of the reasons I, I'm jumping around between skilled nursing facility and and you know outpatient orthopedics and the hospitals is when are you going to get to do that? You know, I'm going to be so marketable when I actually start to settle down because I'm going to say, hey, guess what? I've worked in 20 different settings or 20 different hospitals already, and I have referrals from every single one of them that I started out. And you can't tell me that. You know, it's not that I was flaky and was just jumping around to different places. This was my job. I was pressure release. I hit the ground running, and I got, you know, caseloads done, and I was up and running within a week. You know, I, I'm experiencing this. Whereas somebody that's in a permanent position, they go right over to acute inpatient, you know, and they work there for five years. Can you imagine trying to go from there to an outpatient orthopedic? You'd be screwed. So it really leaves your options open. And I the carryover between education is just learning new settings. Just like I said, I'm like I feel like I'm still a student until every Friday morning when I get a check. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great. I I honestly, and even without the pay, without the pay, I mean, you guys are getting into a great job. It's it's awesome. I can't say enough good things about it. Just as a as a job itself. No one's going into this classroom later, are they? Whatever. I'll just kick them out. I'll lock the door. Okay, we'll be good. I'll get it. I'll get it. Right. Care about it. Um, you get to go to new clinic hospitals. So for me, I'm going to open up a clinic in the future. Going to new hospitals and clinics, you get to see how things are run. You know, you get to see what works, what doesn't. I've been to some, like the last place I was at, it was all over the hospital. You get to see what's really efficient and what is like, why are you guys doing this? Plus, then you get to show up to other hospitals or clinics and be like the rock star when you like reorganize everything. Um, and also, I said this before, you get to see how different colleagues treat. Like for me, the biggest thing that I've seen is like in outpatient orthopedics, you get to see some stuff where like, because we really just know IAOM, you know, a little bit of PNF and like a teeny weeny bit of McKinsey stuff, and you go there and they're doing like Institute of Physical Arts and mutation, counter-mutation with a dog bone, it's crazy. And you're like, you guys are nuts. And then the patients are better. Like, well, I better, I don't care if I have to throw a rock at a patient, if it makes them better, mm -hmm. I think that as well too. So it's nice to, to get around the country and see that stuff. So this is just me. Okay, good. Uh, so this is, I'm kind of done selling it to you. I don't know, I wasn't even really selling it, that was just how it is. Um, what to look out for when you go around to different traveling companies, you need to call around and compare because they're not all the same. If you type into Google traveling physical therapy, there are 50 different companies. My company, which is really large and a national company and has been running in traveling anything for about 50 years, is on the fourth page of Google. That's pretty far down the line. So you need to make sure that you call around, otherwise, you might miss out on some of the benefits. You need to really watch out for the per diem. If you call a company, this is a huge red flag. You call a company and they say, "Okay, Nick, we're going to bump up your per diem to $500 a week, okay, because it's non-tax, but we're going to drop down your hourly rate, but you'll get the same bottom line." It sounds like a great thing. It sounds like you're kind of being weasley and working the loophole, but right, it sounds like you increase your bottom line until you get audited by the IRS because, and they don't tell you this. I had different companies say, don't let anybody tell you this. We maxed out at 280 and you'll never get higher than 280 because of this reason. If, because the, the IRS sets the per diem. If you, if they see that you're making a lot higher tax rate, they'll consider it like a tax fraud and they'll audit you. And then you'll have a bunch of money to pay. That's a red flag. Um, the so-called travel reimbursements. Uh, if you go to Alaska, it's a pretty long way. Some companies will tell you, yeah, we'll, we'll pay for your rental car and we'll pay for your gas and stuff. Well, they may pay for it at that time, 
and make it non-taxable, but the IRS does not count that as a non-taxable thing, so you'll get taxed on that later. Um, holding housing stipends. I had one company, a couple companies tried. I, when, before I did it, I emailed 20 companies. Of those 20, I ended up talking on the phone with 10, okay? And just, I went through the same list of things. I interviewed them. I, I like, listen, I, I'm, I already know I want to do it. You tell me what you guys have for your options. Some of the companies, a couple of, of the smaller companies, like I said with uh, the choice A and B, they find your housing versus you find your own housing. That $1,500 is yours. You should get it regardless of what happens. They said, well, if we find your housing and your housing costs $1,000, we keep the other $500. That company did. My company, they straight up front say, it doesn't matter what you know you do for your housing. If, if you're staying at your aunt's house and it costs you zero, that's your money. So they, they cut me that check. Okay, That's something you need to look out for. Benefits, um, if they don't have benefits, this is a standard. You're not working a job, guys. You're in a career now. And if they don't have medical, dental, and vision, then they're not worth your time because, and the Arius has like awesome medical. It's, it's crazy. So do you pay for that or they? It's, uh, it's like split in half. I paid $50, I want to say 50, 40 or 50 a week and my deductible for the entire year was like two hundred dollars and it was i mean it, when i looked at it and i showed my mom so i was like i don't know i don't know what's going on she's like that is really good health insurance um and that was the high, that was the highest option i chose and then, so they covered the other half other um i know like it was good enough that because i i don't know if everyone knows i had back surgery like six weeks ago and i'm sure that the thing was like way over 150 grand, and my, they covered it. I mean, workers' comp's covering it, but, but my insurance company is like, yeah, don't worry, we got it. So, I don't know. <laughs> First time I've had to deal with that. Um, 401k, they do do it. I don't plan on being with them that long, you know, that I want 401k through them, nor do I know if 401k is the best thing to invest in at the moment. So, <laughs> I'm just staying away from that, but that should be an option. Um, and if company says that they don't, they don't do, you can't build paid time off, that's another red flag. Uh, like with my company, I think it's on, after the second assignment, if I work two assignments in a row with them, then they start saying, okay, now you're accumulating paid time off. So they want to make sure that you're going to be with them a little bit before they, they start to you know, pay for you to go to vacation. Um, yeah, so you acquire it just like any other job. And this is a big one. You want to make sure that you talk to the company that, and make sure that they do not spam your resume. What I mean is, like I said, you know, some people will send, you know, they'll call you before you before you get your resume and then they'll send it off, thanks. Uh, and then they'll send it off with your approval. Some companies won't do that. They'll, they'll jump over that step and they'll just shoot your, your resume off to five different comp, uh, clients or hospitals that are open in Massachusetts, we'll say. And they'll be like, hey, we got an interview for you. That sounds great until you're working with two companies at a time, which is really common, that you work with like two or three recruiters, and you've authorized one recruiter to send your resume off to a hospital, and then company B just decided to say screw it, and they're just trying to throw out a huge net, send your resume off. The hospital gets your resume with your name on it from two different companies that are both bidding for it. It just looks weasley and, and kind of dirty and not it frustrates the hospital because they're trying to fill the position and it looks like they have a ton of applicants and really they're bidding on the same guy. So you want to make sure that, so that doesn't help the profession either. I better hurry up. Uh, best way to do it, you got to be pro, this is really the best way to do, yeah, so uh, be proactive. Don't sit around. I think the second day I was on my Bemidji clinical, or, or I'm still stuck in speed mode, Bemidji assignment, I, uh, was instantly like, hey, where am I going next? I gotta get my state licensure. Because for me, I don't wanna sit around and do nothing like I did for the last two months. It sucks. Uh, you wanna keep going. And if you're, you know, the squeaky, squeaky what wheel gets the oil. So you wanna make sure that you're you're the one getting called. Be honest, if you're working with two or three companies trying to find a job, let them know. They're, they're cool with that. That's standard in the, in the, the business. 
Um, I prefer finding your own housing, Craigslist, uh, especially if you go to a college town, you save on your bottom line. It's nice.